Mm. Hello, and welcome once again to The Hat Historian. I'm particularly excited about this episode, as I'm wearing what is one of my favorite amongst the hats that I own, and I will be talking about the kind of headgear it is. The flat cap. Also known, depending on where you're from, as a golf clap, scally cap, bonnet, Irish cap, and sometimes erroneously as a newsboy cap, which is different, I'll explain shortly, the flat cap has long been a symbol of European working class men and farm workers, particularly from Britain and Ireland, and their descendants elsewhere. Despite being associated with the blue collared, however, it was also adopted by the wealthier classes when out in their country estates due to its comfort, informal stylishness, and agrarian connotations. It is also one of the older styles of hat that I have examined so far to still be commonly worn. Traditionally made of wool, though sometimes also from other materials, this one for example is waxed cotton, it features a small visor onto which the body of the cap is pinned down to form a low flat shape. Thence its name. So let's see where it comes from. Simple round woolen caps have been worn for a long time in colder climates, thanks to their simplicity of manufacture, cheapness, and their versatility in protecting from the weather. You can see variations of this concept, for example, in the beret or the tam o' shanter. In addition to being cheap and easy to manufacture, these could be shaped in order to protect the wearer by, for example, pulling them forward to form a sort of visor, or pulling the excess to the side to shield from the wind. In the case of the flat cap, its origins come from northern England, where men wore what they called a bonnet. This kind of hat evolved into something that was more reminiscent of what you might find in Shakespeare Place, the famous Tudor bonnet, still seen in some academic regalia. It differentiated itself from the other caps I mentioned by having a rudimentary brim that it was pulled down onto. These became popular throughout England in the 14th and 15th century, but it was an odd act of parliament that cemented its presence in society. In 1571, the Statute of Apparel was passed, stating that every man over the age of six was required to wear a cap of wool, thickened and dressed in England, made within this realm, and only dressed and finished by some of the trade of cappers, on all Sundays and holidays, in an effort to bolster the domestic wool trade. People failing to do so faced a fine of three farthings, a little under a penny, or about a dollar and a half today, which not, might not sound like much, but was a non-negligible sum for workers at the time. I say workers because, of course, as is often the case with such things, noblemen were exempt. But that didn't stop them from wearing them as well, often made of silk or velvet, as they found them comfortable and stylish. The law didn't last long, only about 26 years, and was repealed in 1597 as being unworkable. But by then the caps had caught on and become popular in a society where covering one's head was expected. The cap continued to be worn by rural workers for the next couple of centuries with few changes. These caps, however, did not exactly resemble what we now think of as flat caps, being closer to the academic tams that some graduates still wear. In the early 19th century, some enterprising hat maker whose name was sadly lost to history decided to add a stiff visor rather than just rely on the hat being pulled forward in a vague visor shape and pin the top part of the cap to it and thus the modern flat cap was born. Already common amongst rural workers, it came to cities as the Industrial Revolution emptied the countryside and brought in large amounts of laborers to work in factories and construction. These men often took their hats with them, and the flat cap became firmly associated with the working classes. From its origins in northern England and Ireland, it spread far and wide with emigrations to America, Australia, Canada, and other lands with large populations descended from these countries. Britain's influence and the large manufacture of these hats also spread them throughout Europe, particularly Northern and Eastern Europe, where they were quickly adopted by workers there, but also to places like Italy or Turkey, where leader Atatürk promoted them in the 1920s as a replacement of the Fez in his bid to modernize the country. In America, they were popular in places with large Irish populations like Boston and New York, and can be seen in many photographs of the building booms there. Because of climate and migration patterns, they never acquired quite the rural association there that they have in Europe. Another hat that emerged in the 19th century and is closely related to the flat cap is the one I mentioned earlier, the newsboy cap. 
They often get mistaken for each other, but are in fact rather different. The flat cap is made of a long piece of fabric, which is then folded down onto the visor, is more oval shape and less wide, and has a smooth top. The newsboy cap is made by sewing eight triangles of fabric together, often with a button on top, similar to how a baseball cap is made. Its similarity comes from the fact that it is also pinned down to the visor, so the shapes can resemble each other from afar, but the newsboy cap is generally fuller and rounder than the flat cap. The newsboy cap is often more of an urban hat, rarely seen in the countryside, although in American and British cities, they often occupy the same cultural niche and can be seen as interchangeable. It obviously got its name from the 19th century newspaper sellers, young boys who greatly favored the style. As opposed to the newsboy cap, which stayed firmly restricted to the working classes, the flat cap also spread to the European gentry in the post-World War I years. With its rural connotations, it was seen as an acceptable form of headwear for the upper classes to wear on their, or their friends', country estates. Less formal and more comfortable when, for example, riding horses than the tall top hats or stiff bowlers that were seen in the cities. It was also less cumbersome when traveling than fedoras, and would sometimes be worn backwards when driving an open-topped automobile, to avoid having it blown off the head. It was also adopted as part of golfing attire for similar reasons, and can still be seen being worn by the wealthy in Europe, particularly in Britain, at country events such as hunts. It is also popular among some horse riders when not wearing a helmet. These hats are often made of a slightly finer and lighter material than their working class equivalent, often with classic tweed motifs. This hat, like so many others, saw decline in the 1960s as men began to eschew the wearing of headwear altogether. Seen as old-fashioned, as unfashionably rural, for the second half of the 20th century it tended to be associated in many places with older men or slightly eccentric people, such as yours truly. However, due to its previously mentioned cheapness and practicality, as well as its cultural associations with places like Ireland or its working class history, it didn't vanish quite as thoroughly as hats like fedoras or bowlers, enduring in small urban pockets of Britain, Ireland, and New England. From there, it experienced something of a renaissance in the early 21st century. It was adopted by some hip-hop artists who would often wear it backwards or sideways, the same way that they sometimes wear baseball caps. But it also regained favor amongst actors and athletes, as can be seen here. Some subcultures in Europe have adopted it for its working class heritage. It has also bridged the gender gap, being adopted by some women as a style element. Its slightly countercultural look also made it popular with hipsters, maybe because of the erstwhile uncool image I mentioned above. Shows like Peaky Blinders have added to its popularity in recent years though Cillian Murphy's character tends to wear a newsboy cap, not a flat cap. And of course, some people just continue to wear it because they like the look. And it is still quite present in rural Europe, where it first originated. It is probably more worn today than any of the other hats I have talked about so far, and by the looks of it, it's not going anywhere. So I hope once again that you enjoyed this video and will join me again soon for another hat. Until then, I tip my hat to you.